sound can benefit us in many ways. I think, for one thing, it just makes us feel good, right? So mm. let's just take it from there, that it's, um, you don't have to be intellectually aware of what sound healing does. I think everyone on a daily basis experiences sound healing. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, we can start as basic as hearing crickets. You know, this summer, uh, a friend of mine and I were outside in New York City, outside in the country, actually, outside of New York. And, mm -hmm. you know, that cricket hum, you know, that kind of expansion, that crescendo and diminuendo of cricket sound, you know, when you really get into it, it's, it, pr it promotes peace in us. It promotes a certain in-the-moment awareness of where we are, and it, it brings in this summertime relaxed feel, and it really makes us feel good. So, um, you know, that's a benefit of sound is that it relaxes us and makes us feel peaceful. Um, sound can also provide some nostalgia for us. So, you know, there's a benefit right there of hearing a song that may have um, been around when we were younger and it was a really wonderful time in our life. And mm -hmm. so it brings back that kind of nostalgia. You know, if you want to talk more in a scientific way about the effects of sound, um, you know, there have been many studies now for, for a number of years, actually, um, that show sound can promote good hormones in the body. So, you know, serotonin, oxytocin, those kind of hormones that we relate with good feelings and mm -hmm. good health are promoted by sound. Um, in my experience, um, in doing workshops with people on sound for years now, is sound can actually promote good relationships with people. So if we become aware of another person's voice, for instance, and how we're making music with them actually in a conversation, mm -hmm. You know, if you really are in the present moment with someone and you're listening to their vibration and you're responding as if it's a musical venture, mm -hmm. then your relationship actually becomes expanded, right? So does that make sense? It totally makes sense. And I think about the term sound as in, oh, we have a sound relationship. Oh, you know, wow. You can say, that, that word can be used to describe something that is complete or whole or harmonized. So that's really interesting, too. I've, that just came up as you were speaking. Yeah, that's a wonderful realization. Mm -hmm. I'm stealing that. Okay. <laughs> um, well, like we were mentioning earlier, everything is vibration. Yes. Everything in the world vibrates at a frequency or multiple frequencies, yes. which is more often the case. And so sound healing can be a way to tap into the different vibrations of our bodies, our minds, our emotions, our spirit. Yes. Um, and different aspects of our lives. Yes. So before we get into more specific healing modalities, can you tell us a little bit about how you got into this work and, and practice? Sure, sure. Um, so I'm, I'm a classically trained pianist, and I started playing when I was three. And, you know, I was having these sort of, um, I don't want to say out-of-body experiences, but I, w I was playing a lot of music when I was younger. Um, almost at a professional level, and I was playing violin as well in multiple orchestras and performing solo piano, chamber music. Um, I was part of a touring orchestra, the All-State Orchestra. And so I would have, I had one experience in particular where I was on the Cleveland um, Severance Hall stage with, with an orchestra I was touring with. And we were playing the Pines of Rome and Respighi's The Pines of Rome. And uh, I had this, this thing happen to me. I, I mean, I call it like a godlike experience. I'm, I'm not per se uh, religious. I would say I'm spiritual, but um, I just had this experience that I had never had before of like transcending. And, you know, as a 15 year old, how does one explain that? You know, I just thought in that moment, this is where it's at. It was almost as if, I mean, the music really helped us, The Pines of Rome, if you know it. Do you know that piece? No. You should check it out. <laughs> um, but it's just the, the sunlight came out, and I had this experience. And years later, when I learned Transcendental Meditation, you know, in my early 20s, I realized, oh my gosh, that is the kind of experience that I had mm. multiple times throughout my childhood in playing music. Um, so 
I would say I was on a mission from the time I was very small to figure out the mystery behind why this was happening when I was playing music and when I was listening to music. And so that's kind of how it started. And then I would say before it was popular in the mainstream, um, I would say in 2003, 2004, it came to me that I needed to start teaching a workshop called We Are Music. And I didn't really know where it was coming from. I mean, I did read Don Campbell's book. I don't know if you know Don Campbell. He wrote this book called The Mozart Effect in the mid-1990s. And he ended up being my teacher in sound healing school in New York City. Um, and he, he was one of the first people on the scene to really talk about sound as healing, music as healing. And so um, he wrote these books called The Mozart Effect and others where he talked about using Bach for students You've probably heard about this, mm -hmm. where um, they did test studies on people who were listening to Bach studying and people who weren't listening to Bach studying, and that the people who were listening to the Bach did a lot better on their studies. Um, and Mozart, too, and, and other different composers, um, that they had a really healing effect and also brain-boosting effect on people. And so I was, I was sitting with this knowledge in the early 2000s, uh, before it was cool, you know, like before the gongs were on the scene, before the tuning forks were on the scene. Um, and I thought, I'm going to teach this workshop to us at a Suzuki music school in upstate New York that I was teaching at. And so it was a little too ahead of its time because these kids would come in and they'd be like, what do you mean we are music? What are you talking about? Mm -hmm. And so I would play around with like, uh, movement and sound and get them understanding that their heartbeat is music, that their breath is music. Exactly. When someone tells me they don't have rhythm yes. or they're not musical, yes. I say, well, you have a heartbeat. You walk in time. That's exactly the basis of all this. Mm -hmm. And how many times have both you and I heard, oh, I, you're a musician. I am so in awe of that. I could never play music. How many times have you heard that? Oh, every day. <laughs> right? And we both know, it's like, you are music. Yep. You know, you might be music through being a writer. You might yep. be music through having a conversation with someone. You might be music... Through the style of dress you wear. Through the style of dress, through your cooking. Yep. Um, so it, it is all music. And even, um, even some of the more advanced techniques or seemingly advanced techniques, like improvisation. Yeah. I've had students tell me, I don't know how to improvise. And I say, well... You don't read off a script when you speak to people, yeah. so you're improvising your words. You have a basis of vocabulary that you pull from and spontaneously put them together. Yes. Same with your, the clothes you wear in the morning. It's not scripted. You look at your wardrobe and say, I think this will go well with this. Yes. That's improvisation. We all improvise. We're all music. That's, uh, you say it perfectly. Yes. I couldn't have said it better. Uh, so so yeah. this workshop you did was for what age children? I, I've... At that time, I was doing it for everyone, but th three-year-olds to 18-year-olds um, was the Suzuki Music School range. Was there an age that responded best to this, this workshop? So I, I wouldn't say there's an age as much as there is a personality. I mean, you probably come across this in teaching. So um, when I sit down at a piano with a student, um, let's just say they're five, one of them might have a personality that... It cannot improvise unless given very specific um, parameters, you know, whereas others can sit down and if you put a picture of an animal in front of them, you know, they can just come up with something. Mm -hmm. So in that vein, you know, the workshop, um, uh, the, the response to the workshop um, was mixed at first. Some of the kids were really into it and some of them were like, what is this all about? Mm -hmm. You know, um, but in general, when you get kids or anyone in their bodies responding to music, even if they're intellectually going, I don't know what the heck this woman is doing right now in this mm -hmm. workshop, they're responding and you see the way they start communicating with each other and even communicating on the instrument. So I, I had little ones with little violins, you know, the Suzuki ones with the half size, quarter size violins in these workshops. And it didn't matter what notes they were playing. You know, they they were responding to being music and to a playful sense of being in the now, you know, with their music. I love it. Yeah. So after that workshop, 
what other sound healing so, ventures did you get into? Well, after that, if you go linear, I took my yoga teacher training, <laughs> which opened up because, well, for me, the piece has always been the embodiment of music. Mm -hmm. So, you know, from a young age, people used to tell my parents, you know, she looks, Meg looks like she's one with the piano. Right. And I didn't know what that meant as a kid. My parents would say, you know, oh, so and so said you look like you're one with the piano. And as I started getting older, I wanted to look at that and realized, I guess there's some a part of me that has always felt that I am not separate from it. And so um, I kind of wanted to um, explore body work to see how my body responded to music. And so I went off on this whole tangent after I left Eastman School of Music where I studied Reiki and I studied this movement technique called Continuum and then I got my yoga teacher training. And all of this kind of was a reinforcement of what I knew all along, that we are vibration, <laughs> that we are sound. I mean, even in yoga, you realize in Nada Yoga about the inner sacred sound that we are all in our movements an expression of vibration. Um, so I just wanted to be more embodied and more understanding of how I am in response to the instrument in my body. So I went there, and then I did sound healing training, officially. That was at the Open Center in New York City. They do all sorts of courses. Have you, have you heard of the Open Center? I don't think so. It's a... It's, uh, now that COVID is around, I don't know how much they're doing in person, but um, it was pretty much the training to do in North America at the time. I did this in 2010 through 2012. I had some major, major sound healing teachers in that. We sort of had a buffet style sound healing training from all of the best all over the world. Wow. So there was John Ballou who wrote a book called um, Human Tuning. And he specializes in tuning forks. And I recommend anybody that has any interest in looking at tuning forks as a modality of healing to look at his book and find him, John Ballou. And then I had Pat Moffat Cook, who is an amazing indigenous sound healer. She has a clinic in Santa Fe called the Open Ear Institute. Her work was very profound. She studied with she didn't study. She actually was invited into these indigenous tribes all over the world where most, quote, white people are not invited. And she took video and observed these very, very, very indigenous old school healers working on people. Incredible. So that was potent. I had uh, John uh, Don Campbell, who wrote The Mozart Effect, who I was talking about. He has now passed. Um, let's see who else was there. There was Joshua Leeds who wrote The Power of Sound. And he wrote this amazing book too on his research with dogs mm. called Through a Dog's Ear. And I have to tell you, this one in particular really um, speaks to me because I love dogs. Um, so he worked with a concert pianist and they developed through clinical studies with a veterinarian CDs that um, calm dogs down. Well, and it's interesting because I've heard that dogs have a much higher frequency range mm -hmm. that they hear than we do. So mm -hmm. can our modern stereo systems even replicate those frequencies or how do that? Can you just explain a little bit about this, the dog music? This <laughs> sure, is really fascinating to me. So, so when, when Joshua Leeds took apart sound and people's and animals response to it, he, he broke it down into three parts, tone, tempo, and pattern. Okay, so I'll give you, this is a famous piece by Mozart. Whoop, sorry about that. I was on the wrong pedal there. Right? So tone would be what? I mean, what, what would you think of as tone with that? Um, I think of the range of, okay. the, of the notes. So like from... Up yeah, just down. that area of the piano. Yes. Those frequencies. Yes. I also hear major quality. Right. Uh, um, what about like a happier tone? I mean, that's a judgment, but. Well, <laughs> like, and I was taught in mu in recording school not to use such subjective exactly, terms exactly, to describe right. music. So I hesitate to say happier exactly, or this. So I right. said, yeah, major quality and <laughs> right. specific range of frequencies, which is much more objective. Right. So like this compared to. 
Right. Right? Has a completely different tone than. Or, um. So, so that's tone, and then tempo. Mm-hmm. How do you how do you describe that? That's pulse. That's um, how you would tap your foot D, D, or D, nod your head D, to the D, music. D, exactly. D, D, One, two, D, three, D, four. D, D, D. Instead of you know like uh, right. Too much coffee played for that one. <laughs> we know that one well. <laughs> so tempo and then pattern. So what about pattern? To me, that brings to mind phrases and repeating of the phrases yes. and getting the ear tuned into something you just heard and you hear it again and it's familiar. So like lower, lower. Right, it has the same interval and contour. Right. Yeah. Right, so so what, what he discovered is dogs respond to um, a particular tempo actually. It's really interesting. So. He did find that they responded very well to Mozart and Beethoven, actually. He noticed they were responding to the harmonics of what they were doing. But what he noticed was they would respond best to a very particular tempo, which may not have been what Mozart or Beethoven or Bach wrote it at. Hmm. So he and this concert pianist, what they did was they, they experimented with the vet to see, to watch the... Um, the movements, you know, and the moods of the dogs. And what really brought them down was a particular tempo at a heartbeat type of tempo. The so, dog's heartbeat. Well, like more like what we would think of as a human heartbeat, like mm. around 60 to 65, between 60 and 70. Interesting. So when I went to Joshua Leeds, I said, you know, I'd like to go to Humane Societies and bring my keyboard and do like gigs for dogs and I, I did this at our school umass lowell when we were both there together i don't know if you knew i did that but i went to you know that humane society yeah, that right was down right the next to the, the school from the music building yeah i went and i took my keyboard and i said look and they they had his cd there they played the cd during you know the day for these dogs to calm them down so i said look i studied with this guy i'm a pianist he's kind of taught me how to do this can i play for your dogs so I went in there, and so, like, with a piece like this, you know, that a normal tempo people might play this at, you know. You know, Joshua Leeds and this woman discovered, oh, what about something like... And, and then you'll also notice I got rid of the Alberti bass, you know this? Mm-hmm. So the more um, frenetic stuff going on, the less relaxed the dogs would be. So the harmonics of classical music are wonderful for them, right? These one, four, five progressions, you know, these very um, beautiful harmonies are wonderful. But he was saying, take out that they'll, and just keep it a simple chord. Maybe even take out that, just take that out. So it's kind of like. Well, because the less active, how do I put it? The less active the music is, the more time there is for those harmonics to ring out. Exactly. And but, that's what the dogs pick up on? Yes, even this, you know. Right? I remember playing this for them. <laughs> but I could even just. You know, you get that. We even, like, I see your face right now. You're like, oh, man, yeah, that's I want just a, so rich. I want a CD of just that. Right? <laughs> yeah. This is a funny, can I tell you a humorous story of Please. what happened at the Humane Society that day? Yeah. So there was a husky there named Jax, and there was a boxer, and there were a bunch of other big dogs, like pit bull types. And um, right near me at the back of the kennel where I was playing were all the small dogs in one cage together. <laughs> I just laugh thinking about this. So at first, you know, everybody's like, rah, 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 you know, and the little dogs are yipping, yipping, yipping. And so I noticed, I, I did a 45 minute set, right? And the little dogs were the first, I started hearing them snoring. And then 
Jax, the bo- the um the Siberian Husky, he started singing with me. Beautiful. Probably midway through. Love and that. you know, it's how you know, so it was that was amazing. I started crying. I was like playing in tears. <laughs> and then this boxer, I forgot his name, but he just wouldn't stop the whole time. I was like, okay, so you know, I don't have a fan. <laughs> what can I say? But uh, it was it was it's a phenomenal experience to do that. And the dogs I've owned, you know, because I practice the piano a lot at home, they always come and they lay right on my feet while I'm playing. So that's interesting. They like the slower tempos because to me, a dog runs at a faster pace his whole system yes you know you hear them yes. breathe <laughs> exactly. super fast exactly. their, their, their heartbeat is much faster they're just they live shorter lifespans everything just seems sped up in a dog but it's interesting once you take out a lot of the notes yes and you let these harmonics ring through yes and give it space dogs do pick up on that they really do that's amazing yeah so back to your initial question pitch frequency, I I think they discovered you don't have to hit them at that high pitch in order to get their attention. You know, it doesn't have to start there. Well, also because the overtones of any note played on an acoustic instrument have extremely high frequencies that we can't hear. Exactly. uh, And many that we can. Yeah. And which is what maybe is a reason that dogs may respond better to acoustic instruments than through a speaker. True. Because a speaker can't replicate past a certain frequency. True. But acoustic instruments will ring infinitely based on its nature. Yes. And on that note, a lot of dogs don't like saxophone. Maybe <laughs> maybe I was just playing too fast. Maybe I was just playing too many notes, Meg. I'm going to try. Seriously, Seth, take some of it out. Just let yourself really, like, take Coltrane and just take a little bit of coffee edge off the Coltrane, yeah. you know. And Turn just... it down to 0.1x speed. Yeah. See what happens. All right. So you were doing some work with animals. That's yeah. great. Mm-hmm. Um, what other sound healing ventures did you get into? Well, I, I've worked with really large groups of people. Like I was asked to present at the International Expressive Arts Therapy Conference in Hong Kong a few years ago. And there were people from all over the world there. Most of them in my workshop didn't speak English. And that was great because it was a sound <laughs> workshop. Um, but I really use a lot of voice. Um, I use a lot of um, journeying work. So uh, I think some of the most impactful uh, healing I've had on myself through sound was the sound journeys I was taken on. So, you know, in those big workshops I was giving, I would have people lay in shavasana and I would use all sorts of rhythmic instruments, you know, instruments we would label as shamanic, you know, so drum rattles, um, all sorts of uh, um, like chimes and otherworldly sorts of instrument sounds I would use and take people down into kind of a shamanic state, you know, and very carefully work them down and then very carefully work them up. This is a, sound journeys can be very curated mm-hmm. and should be curated, actually. Is a standard rock concert a sound journey? Oh, Wow. Well, if you're ta- asking me, absolutely. I mean, the first time I heard The Grateful Dead, I was like, Mm-mm, nothing's beating this. And, <laughs> you know, a lot of my maybe classical musician counterparts and jazz people even would be like, what are you talking about? And uh, yeah, of course, of course. I mean, I've, I, you know, recently I was listening to a, a Dizzy Gillespie album just, f- you know, as I was going to sleep from front to back. And that was a journey. I mean, it's just amazing. Yeah. You know, so I mean, if we're talking in the specific sound healing world, um, I can tell you what we were taught to do, you know, if you'd like that, to sort of take people down and bring them up. I mean, I can tell you about that if you want. Or sure. Go, Let's hear about it. You want? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> okay. We're trying to learn as much as we can about sound healing today. <laughs> well, here's what's interesting. So we talked a lot about working with kids and uh, especially kids that are I I, I hate to use the term ADD because I almost don't believe in it anymore after all the work I've done on healing and myself and others. And um, let's just say people that have a lot of energy, and I'm one of those people, I think you are too, Mm -hmm. right? Um, When you're, let's say you walk into a classroom or you walk into a sound healing space Mm -hmm. and there's this people just running around 
not, you know, let's just say people, maybe they're adults or three-year-olds. Let's yep. just general audience. And they're at this high vibration, right? So you would think, okay, I'm going to play something, you know, I'm going to, here's these s s spazzy people. I'm going to really calm them down right now. I'm going to just start with this. Right, you'd think that, right? But that's not quite meeting no, them where they're at. I, well, so you're, you know all this stuff. So, <laughs> right, so basically you learn that you have to meet an audience where they're at, right? And when I worked with the dogs, I did the same thing. I actually used a lot more tempo and pattern when I started. And when I got towards the middle, I was taking all that inner stuff out of the music. And really, at the end, I was like pretty much, you know, just like, one chord, you know, just one chord. You know, just one chord, just one chord. Um, so, so in a journey, you want to start people off with where they're at, you know, and then it basically we were sound is a manipulative tool. Mm -hmm. It's far more mani manipulative than one would ever think. You are being manipulated every time you walk out the door. Yeah. If you watch TV, you're being manipulated by sound. Mm -hmm. um, you're being manipulated by sound in the air conditioning system. And I always say words are magic, right? Yes. I could say three words to you that would drastically change your entire consciousness and chemical, you know, reaction in your body. Yes. Yeah, it's that's true. So, so when you're working with, let's just use children as an example. Let's say you have a classroom of five year olds, mm -hmm. and you want to take them on a sound journey. Mm -hmm. So you manipulate them, but we're manipulating for the highest and best good of all. You know, totally. I, I do that through whenever I do a healing, whenever I do a class, I just always, you know, for the highest and best good of all, let this unfold, you know, for everyone. And so you walk into this class and you just start with like, you know, the most spasmodic music you could possibly think of, right? Um, and you let them work it out. You mm -hmm. let them exhaust themselves. I mean, parents know this, right? It's just a given. And so then you can bring them down. You, you curate your sound journey so that by the middle portion, they are like down, down, mm -hmm. down in the ground, you know. And when, when I learned about um, in my yoga teacher training about playing music for Shavasana, which is a little bit... Um, of a, of a controversy. Some people don't use music at all during corpse pose, that right. last pose, but some people do. They use it as a journey, right? Um, I was just taught, you know, you, you start at a certain point and you really, by the music you choose, you can really bring them down, right? Absolutely. So, you know, the journeying involves that. And then if you don't want them to walk out of the classroom, get into, the, well, three-year-olds aren't going to get into their cars, but, you know, bang their heads around or whatever, you want to bring them back up slightly maybe with something, you know, not where they began, but, you know, just it's a wonderful thing to curate a sound journey. I recommend it for everyone. I think also people do this subconsciously. If they're a leader of a group yes, and the, and the meeting starts and everyone's ah this high energy. They're going to start up here and da 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 da. And then maybe they take it down, and then they've got the group where they want them. It, yes. And can create change or create whatever they're working on that day. Yes. And then maybe give them a nice solid message to push them back out into the world. I think we do this subconsciously without even knowing it. Yes, absolutely. And you know, people are also creating when they create their Spotify lists mm. or their Pandora lists. Mm -hmm. They're creating their own journeys for themselves too. And they're meeting themselves where they're at. Absolutely. And, you know, it's, it, you can journey yourself every day, mm -hmm. you know. And there's so many aspects to sound. There's not only the tempo and the tone and the pattern mm -hmm. like you described. There's lyrics, <laughs> right, exactly. you know, and that's a whole other dimension of things that can make you feel that manipulates somebody yes. into feeling a certain thing. And, yes. you know, I think we love music either for the, for the beat or the tone or mm -hmm. for the lyrics. Yes. Or usually it's a mixture of everything. Yes. So, well, that's a controversial topic, lyrics. Why? Um, well, you know, my yoga teacher, he was a student of BKS Iyengar and um, very traditional yoga training. And um, he, he was kind of a little bit against using lyrics and music for Shavasana because it 
brings people back into their intellectual mind sometimes. D- I totally get that. Right? And and same sound healing. I mean, don't get me wrong. I have to say that any music is healing. I, you don't know the, the, the range of music that I listen to in a day would blow people's minds given my background. Mm-hmm. And a lot of it has lyrics. But sometimes it's better to not be manipulated by the lyrics because we don't want to be in a story necessarily. Mm -hmm. We want to be more in the cells of our body. We want to be in our bones and in our muscles and just out of our heads. And so a lot of sound healing goes to that place without words. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. So, And there are times in the day where I want to listen to hip hop with lyrics and there are times in the day where I want to listen to instrumentals. Yes. Because, yeah, one takes me more into the head. Yes. And I can think about the story they're, they're saying. and Or I just want to feel that beat, feel the samples they're using, feel the bass line. And it's, it's more of a heart um, feeling than a brain one. Absolutely. Can I say one more thing about that? Please. I, I almost want to preach this. I posted this on Facebook last week. But a lot of people think that classical music is heady music in the brain. And I just want to debunk that right now you know I, I i've listened to the goldberg variations now i don't know hundreds of times i've played them in my life you know but uh, a couple of weeks ago on my journeying i've been on traveling across the united states i i was somewhere i don't remember where and and uh i just in my meditation that day i closed my eyes and i put on the goldberg and i listened to the whole thing and the places this took me in my body mm-hmm. not in my mind it, i mean it, it I'm someone that's sensitive to how it actually moves my tissue around. Like, wow. that's how sensitive to sound I am. So I'm listening to this, and I can explain to you the scientific reason for that in a minute, why sound is so powerful. But I'm listening to the Goldberg, and I'm feeling um, vibration and uh, moving in different parts of my body, depending on what's going on in the music, you know, like my heart area, or the different chakras, right, are moving, depending on what's going on. And so I just want to make an ad right now for classical music that you do not need to know one darn thing about it. I know there's a lot of campaigns right now in symphonies across the world, you know, we have to educate the people. No, you really don't. Mm -hmm. First of all, you don't have to make them sit in their tuxedos facing forward for the whole concert. That's one thing. Let them get up and move around, dance or whatever. But you, I don't think you need to create story behind these things. Mm-hmm. I think you just have to create an environment where they can feel in their body and not think about it. Absolutely. Know? We live in such a intellectual, left-brain dominant society yes. that if we encounter a style of music that we're not used to, maybe that's classical music, I think often people feel the need to intellectualize it, to wrap their minds around it, say, yes. wait, what? compare it to other music they're listening to, and they're missing exactly. the point of yes. the of the music itself, which is to take you on a journey and you can feel it and that it'll touch your heart if you just open that up and maybe don't worry so much about the mental part of it. Well, and that's why, you know, a big shout out for for New Orleans and you having lived here, I I just have to tell you that I'm in awe of you having come from, I don't know how many degrees in music you have. I don't know if you want to advertise (laughs) it. How many do you have? Two. Okay. (laughs) to me you know we were at umass lowell together Mm -hmm. and um i i think when you did this when you came down here and like you're on the streets and you're in your you're working it it's like yes yes because getting an academic you and i both can attest i have degrees through my doctoral work at eastman Mm -hmm. you know all degrees in piano performance Mm -hmm. at conservatories get out of your head get out of academia and just go do it you know, just go do it. And this music down here is, I mean, I was here a few years ago on the streets in February and just like, I'm one who I, I dance wherever I am. And like, I need to, I need to feel this in my body no matter what. And so here is a wonderful place. Oh, to, big time. Right? Big time. I mean, I'm glad you brought that up. Just the culture of New Orleans is all about feeling. Whereas the academic culture way too left-brained, Yeah, need to know everything about the music, need yes. to, you know, theorize about what's going on. Down here, there's no discussion of music theory. Sometimes the players don't even know the names of the songs. Right. Because they just know what it sounds like. As, he- as soon as that tuba line strikes up, I know what to do. Right. And it's all based on feeling. It's all based on ear. 
and yeah, moving down here really stepped up my musicianship mm. because I was operating more on a level of feeling, less thinking. Yes. But it was hard at first because I came from academia. I had just gotten a master's degree and I was a teacher mm -hmm. and I was trying to teach people the inner workings of music verbally, you know, like yes. intellectually. Yes. And uh, just coming down here, nobody was having any of that. There was no place for music theory or, you know, naming anything we were doing. We just did it. Yes. Down here, I, I taught for two years at a middle school. It was an elementary middle school and I was the assistant marching band director. Mm -hmm. We introduced the kids to sheet music a little bit, maybe like for a week or two mm -hmm. in the spring. For the most part, these kids learned 30 songs for the parades all by ear. Mm -hmm. I don't think the elementary school that I went to or the middle school that I went to is capable of doing that with the way they, the way they teach music. So you're Bravo. right. Yeah, down here, it's, it's all about soul. It's all about feeling. Yeah, I, can I, let me add to that. Um, uh, an, a boyfriend of mine a long time ago, um, was trying to convince me to go to Elkins, West Virginia, to the Augusta Heritage Festival. Do you know about that? Mm -mm. It's a very famous festival that um, has like a Creole week, a blues week, a uh, Americana week, this whole kind of thing. Um, and uh, he he he's um, a body worker, but really was into learning music. And he always admired me for being a musician. And um, he was just saying, look, you really need to come to this festival in west virginia with me mm -hmm. and i wasn't having it i was like i'm too good for that <laughs> you know i am i am a pristine classically trained musician why would i want to go down with you amateurs and do this americana music so it was literally the day of he was packing up the car we were in upstate new york and he's packing up the car to drive to west virginia and i said fine fine i'll go and it was it was blues week mm -hmm. he was he played um blues guitar so i go down and i'm i i was just kind of not having it but i did it just for to see what it was like and whatever and um i ended up in a blues piano workshop with uh, uh daryl davis who's a major major like chuck berry pianist and you know this other guy arthur migliazzo who plays major major blues piano and I was in there with a bunch of amateur musicians, um, but Daryl Davis really took to me, and he was his hands were five times the size of mine, you know. <laughs> and we were we were learning like this Pine Top Perkins blues stuff, you know. And I had the chops, like the other people didn't really have the chops, you know. So Daryl would come over and really help me, you know, doing this, you know, just this kind of like, uh, mm -hmm. you know, boogie woogie bass lines and stuff, and. Um, he's like, Meg, you just have to throw your hands on the piano. You literally just have to like, you know, when I was doing, you know, you just have to like, because as a, as a, as a um, classically trained pianist, I'm like, okay, every finger has right. to be placed, you know, and he's like, oh. you know, I just like throw it. Yeah. And, you know, my hands are literally a third the, of the size of his and. I was just beaming, you know, and, and he's like, come on, you got to sing with this stuff, you know? And so that year I walked away from there. I was like, okay, I've got the chops to do this. I can do this. This is awesome. My heart started to be warmed to blues music. I started really getting into listening to a ton of blues, playing blues. And then the next summer he says to me again, I'm going down for the Americana Festival like early American music, like porch music. And I was like, I'm down. Nice. <laughs> so this time we went and I, st I started singing gospel music from Jubilee Gospel from the 1930s. I was singing Wade in, Wade in the Water with like a quartet. Nice. And then one night we, we'd all go out to the bars at night and like the old timers that, you know, play the, the porch musicians, you know, in their 60s, 70s, who've just lived down there their whole lives would come and, and, and play. So they asked me to play, join in with them one night. And there was this rickety piano, you know. And so I started playing with them. And they were like, wow, you, this is great. And, you know, I was really feeling like I could get in my heart finally. It was mm. like three or four chords, you know, or like mm -hmm. harmonic minor scales or melodic. And I was like, yes. And then I turned to the violinist who's literally like in his 70s, you know, been playing porch music his whole life, hasn't left West Virginia. And I said, you know, that's a melodic minor scale you're playing. And he's like, no. 
I didn't, I didn't uh, know anything about that, you know? And he's like, we have a lot to learn from each other. And it's like, who cares what it's called? You know, mm. all this time I had spent in school trying to, you know, label all this stuff when I really just needed some time with these guys to mm -hmm. really get in my heart. And I think my life, that's when I really got into sound healing and like the power of the heart mm -hmm. in music, you know? Absolutely. That was a long story, but it was... <laughs> no, I mean, it makes perfect sense. It definitely correlates and resonates with me as far as my experience moving down here because it's all based in the heart and, well, in the ear. We as a culture tend to separate different organs and different aspects of everything and, and we isolate things so much. But one of the themes of this show that all my guests talk about is that healing is a holistic practice. Absolutely. And so we might say things like the ear or the heart, but to me, the inner ear is, is your entire organism that can take in information. Yes. That's your ear, right? Yes. You can hear without using your ears even. Yes. Um, and heart, similar thing. I mean, it's not, we're not just isolating that pump. Yes. We're talking about something way bigger, maybe even the soul. Yeah. And I can actually give you the biological scientific reason, Etymo um, not etymology, <laughs> that's a study of words. Um, I, I'm not coming up with the right word right now. But in my workshops, I show people pictures of a of a 10 week, 12 week old fetus. And um, basically, what it looks like is, um, we don't have a tummy yet, our heart looks like the tummy, okay? And our mouth is on top of the beating heart as are our hands. So our hands have actually been shaped by the beating of our heart as have our lips in those early stages of embryology. That's what it is. Embry and the embryo is at that stage um, being shaped by the beating of the heart. Okay. Wow. So I show that picture right away in my workshops, the We Are Sound workshops, because... The heart, I call my workshops the heart of sound because the heart is everything, right? So if you put your hands to your lips right now, you're going to feel the, the beating of your heart and how it shaped them. And the palms of your hands were literally directly on that organ as well. And so then if you want to get into toning, we can do that. And I can tell you, you know, why don't we, should we slip into toning? And Absolutely. I can... Yeah. Because it's a good segue here. So before I talk about this technique of toning that everybody can do, um, I can just tell you uh, biologically, anatomically, how sound affects our whole body, like what you were saying. Okay, so um, do you know what the cochlea is? So the Yeah, the cochlea is the shell-shaped uh, inner part of your inner ear that has hairs on it that Cilia. That cilia that can pick up the vibrations of different frequencies. Yes. And so the outer frequencies pick up the higher sounds. And as the snail shell wraps around, you get into deeper and deeper frequencies, right? Um, and so at the very um, inner, inner part of the cochlea, um, there is a connection there to the vagus nerve, which is the vagus nerve is probably the most potent organ in the entire body it connects it connect i mean it's not an organ it's a the most potent nerve because it connects with every single organ in the body except for maybe the spleen i think and that's v-a-g-u-s vagus yes, nerve yes and so the vagus nerve um when we hear music it actually so the the sound comes in through the ear and um it's, it's vibrated. And so that nerve, it takes it through the entire system, um, through all the organs. And that's as simple as it gets, really. I mean. Wow. I didn't know. I've been hearing a lot more about the vagus nerve, listening to certain chiropractors, because they say it's really important to free up that nerve from any potential pressure, because it's just a, I don't, I don't know if the word valuable, this is a really important nerve in your body. To be aware of. So I didn't know it was connected to the cochlea like that. It is. And so if when we do this particular thing called toning, which mm -hmm. toning is probably, if you look at any sound healer across the world, it's the most common form of sound healing used, toning. Um, so when we tone, we, we directly contact the vagus nerve. Um, 
So I'm just going to give you a little more uh, anatomy before I do it. Sure. So if you envision the spot right, like what they call your third eye, right between your eyebrows there Mm -hmm. at the top of your nose, and it kind of curls down. If you were to put both of your hands right over your face, like... Over your cheekbones. Over your cheekbones. So the top part of your cheekbone... It's called the sphenoid bone. It's a butterfly-shaped bone, and it actually um, runs from the tip of your top of your nose all the way to your bottom of your ear, and attaches to the cochlea. Okay, so um, when we vibrate that area, the sphenoid bone, it actually um, vibrates the cochlea even more, which vibrates the vagus nerve even more, and so we get more of that flushing out. Of the system, mm. it's it's sort of like a, a vibrational flushing out, like the ultimate sound healing to flush out all the organs. Um, it also uh, the sphenoid bone attaches, um, you know, to the to the hor- uh, glands and the third eye area there. So those release hormones like um, serotonin and oxytocin and those kind of hormones from there. So you're dealing with with some really good stuff. Um, so with the toning, it's really just humming. Okay. <laughs> but we do it in a particular way so that we can vibrate that bone more so that it connects with the vagus nerve and hits our whole body. I'll demonstrate for you, and uh, I'm just going to tell you that it's really Im- important to purse your lips slightly so that you you get more of that vibration up in that bone. Um, if, if you can try and hum, try it, try it now, Seth, just hum without pursing your lips and mm. notice the, the, the nasal bones and the face bones. And now this time, almost like you're going to kiss your grandmother on the cheek. Don't be tense though. Just keep a nice, relaxed, pursed lip and try it now and see if you can feel the vibration a little bit better. See, I can hear it more in your nasal bones. Now. I Did felt it that? more in my hard palate, sort of. Okay, right. So up, it's going up mm-hmm. that way. And and so that's why we ask you to purse the lips a little bit during the toning so that we are specifically vibrating. Okay. So I always like to use a drone with this, but before we use the drone, I just want you to hear me do it without a drone mm-hmm. so that you can hear it very purely and pristinely. And all I'm doing is I'm taking a breath in and I'm pursing my lips a little bit and I'm letting it roll. And I'd like you to take note of how you feel before I do it, and then notice how you feel after. I'll do it a few times. Why did you change the pitch, that third one? Well, first tell me how you feel, and then I'll explain that. I feel great. I feel calm, and I feel harmonized. If, you do. Actually, I really felt that way after the second tone you did, mm-hmm. but the third one, you changed the pitch, mm-hmm. and I kind of snapped out of mm. the state that I got into. Uh-huh. So that my point was demonstrated perfectly then. And I hope that my sister (laughs) listens to this podcast because she said to me, does it matter if I keep keep the same tone? And someone else uh, asked me recently um, because they had started the practice and they said, but I want to sing all over the place. I want to hum. And and, and so um, I will tell you this, that there's something very powerful about staying on one tone. Well, isn't that why classical Indian musicians stay within a certain mode or raga? Because 
they're vibrating the space with a certain set of pitches. And as soon as you choose a pitch that's outside of that collection, it kind of messes up the vibration that you've been building and cultivating in this space. It can have a lot to do with that. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It's it's almost like a grounding, right? It's like it grounds us. And then the brain, if we change, has to go through that rigmarole, that, that adjusting again to the new pitch. Mm-hmm. So I'm so happy that you reacted <laughs> that way because that was kind of my point. Um, another point in me doing that too, though, was that it doesn't matter what pitch you do it on. Okay. So I was kind of giving people an option. You don't have to do the pitch I did, you don't have to do the same pitch every day. But I do recommend that for a w- at least for each session, let's start with like one to three minutes. Okay. You just stay on one pitch. Okay. Um, I've had students who um, have done this. I, I, I prescribe it because it is medicinal and it can be too much. Okay. So I prescribe it to people and I say, try it one to three minutes for three months and then let me know. Three months for anything, like, you know, you go to an Ayurvedic doctor, you go to a, um, like a Chinese doctor or, you know, different different modalities always say, or exercise, you know, try it for three months and There's see what happens. There's something about 90 days that the body can adapt to, to within that time. Yes. Yeah. And so I, I recommend, you know, playing with it, seeing what happens. Um, and let me just, I want to share one quick story. I have to share it. And it involves a UMass Lowell student. I was, um, teach, I taught toning to every single one of my students at UMass Lowell, whether they were a piano student or in my chamber music classes or guitar on the, like I taught electric guitar ensemble there. And I had everybody toning. Um, I had a piano student come to me early on, um, before I had taught the toning. I, I had just gotten there actually. And he said, you know, I'm failing oral skills, Meg, failing oral skills. I'm a musician. I got, <laughs> I'm in music school and I'm failing. And what I know about toning is that it can actually, it tones the cochlea so much that our hearing becomes more astute. Hmm. So I didn't know for sure what would happen, but I said, look, I'm going to give you this little technique. I want you to do this one to three mi- minutes for three months and let me know. And with most students, you just kind of give it to them. And I was like, eh, you know, if, if he does it, great. If not, I didn't check up on him. Kind of forgot I gave it to him. So about three months later, he came to me and he said, um, I just want to tell you that I'm, I'm acing my oral skills class. And he said, my teacher, um, who you and I both know, he, my teacher said to me, what have you been doing? And he said, well, Meg gave me this technique and I... He said, I showed the teacher, and the teacher said, I want to teach that to all of my classes now, because this teacher was absolutely stunned that someone that didn't have that capacity of ear could actually develop that. So do you want to try it with me to a drone, then? Absolutely. Okay. So then a lot of times what I do is I'll give people um, in my workshops um, or yoga teachers that want to use this in their practice or with their students, you can take the toning into an oming. So do you, shall we take it into an om? Yes.
So after a while, if you feel called to um, start improvising with your voice, you know, absolutely do it. A lot of people say, well, I feel like I have to hold myself back, you know, and I just say, look, give yourself a certain amount of time with the toning so that you don't change the pitch. That's your practice. Could be just one minute. Go into your oming and then see what happens. You can play with not only the vowels, but like these uh, ta, 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 pa, pa, pa. A lot of people make the assumption that when they hear a Vedic chant, it's religious. But I like to remind people that the Vedic chants um, were actually derived from channeling primordial sound. So that even the sound of Om, some people might attach a religious or spiritual significance to, but it actually has a very um, vibrational significance beyond any intellectual, religious, spiritual understanding, it's, it's an actual vibrational understanding. It's universal. It's a universal thing. So these chants, although could be interpreted, they came from the Vedas, right? From the Hindu Vedic knowledge. But the, the, the understanding is that they were channeled from a primordial universal source. So um, I can give you an example of one of those. This is a, a Shiva chant to Lord Shiva. But again, it doesn't have to be. I mean, e there is meaning behind this chant. It's basically just um, universal protection, this chant is. But it's tapping into what the sounds are of each of the Sanskrit vowels. Om Triambakam Yajamahe Shugandim Pushti Vardhanam Nirvarukamiva bandhanam rityor mukshiyamam ritata Om triambakam yajamahe sugandim pushti vardhanam Nirvarukamiva bandhanam rityor mukshiyamam ritata Om. There's the famous Gayatri mantra Om Bhur Bhuvasvaha Tat Savitur Varenyam Bargo Devasya Dimahi Dioyo na prachodayat Om bur bhuvasvaha tat savitur varenyam Bargo devasya dimahi Dioyo na That's like the universal light, just bringing in the sun and the light. So yeah, I mean, we, we, we started with toning, and then we took it through to oming, and then to open vowels into humming. You can take it into singing. You know, a lot of singers, I give this uh, as their warm-up practice. You can go into your, you know, you know all right, of right, your right. stuff. Or your la 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 after this. Toning seems like a good foundation. That was actually the one that I liked the best. It had the biggest physical difference in my body yeah. because I felt it very strongly in my face, in yeah. my skull. Yeah. And I noticed you're right that the pursing of the lips enhances that vibration. Yes. The ohm 
You do some with your mouth open, right? The A and the U yes. sound. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, you let yes. the, fill your mouth. And then the, um, yes. the M syllable is where you get the vibration and you can feel it in your face more. I personally really like toning. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep doing some more of that it's, in my life. Yeah, since see what happens. I mean, I noticed um, that... Um, <laughs> Should we turn that off? Yeah, let's turn the shruti off. Please fade that out, Chris. I mean, I guess it's 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 maybe couldn't be scientifically proven, but I feel like in periods, I, I did probably six years of toning every day. I felt like, especially when going through transitions, um, there's a powerful thing that can happen with toning where it, oh, here's here's what uh, what else toning does is it shifts the neurotransmitters in the brain. You know, these the neurotransmitters can have these habitual, um, like train tracks that they run on your whole life. Mm -hmm. But when you're working with toning, shaking up that, the pineal gland uh, up there and the um, pineal, what's the other P gland? The, um, uh, anyway, the, the, you know, the, the hormonal glands up there and hitting the vagus nerve. Pituitary, what? Pituitary thank you, gland? thank you, Chris. That's right, the pituitary. I love that. That's great. <laughs> so um, the Wizard of Oz gave us the pituitary gland. <laughs> um, so when, when we're working with that, we're actually shifting those habitual train tracks of, you know, some of this negative thinking or of even um, health issues, habitual um, nerve issues or habitual um, body issues that are going on. We can actually shift that with toning. Yeah, habit and conditioning makes us run on these these train tracks like you mentioned these patterns yeah where it's almost ingrained some of our old habits and and even injuries and and disease can can get stuck in our body yeah so you're saying that toning is a good way to kind of maybe wash away some of those or establish new new connections i think both and and to be honest i i've been you know i keep my eye on different healing modalities because it's really my passion like yours is and um, there's a lot of cardiologists now, a lot of, a lot of different, um, Western medical allopathic doctors that are recommending toning for people because there's been, there's been studies. There have been scientific, um, studies showing that this actually works. Has benefit. Yeah. Wide range of benefits. Wide. Very cool. And also I suppose <laughs> it has been compared with a Viagra of sorts. I'm just saying. All sorts of benefits. <laughs> That's amazing. Meg, if people want to know more about your work, where can they go? Do you have a website? I do. It's my name. So it's M-E-G-R-U-B-Y dot com. MegRuby dot com. All right. And um, there's a few CD releases. Um, there's a CD that I made um, of classical music for kind of the sound healing versus just, oh, go listen to some classical music. And it's called The Moon Has Now Risen. And um, it's available on every platform. So if you look up Meg Ruby, uh, the moon has now risen, you'll find it on iTunes, Amazon, and all that. That's the one with the yellow cover? With the piano, with the on, piano it? on it. And then there's also a newer release, um, David Fink. Um, he's a, a heavy jazz cat in New York, bass player. And I'm featured on two of uh, his tracks on Basic Instinct that just came out last week. Very so nice. that's in the jazz vein. Exciting. Yeah. Meg, thank you so much for joining me today. Wow, thank you for having me, Seth. This was like so spontaneous. It was very spontaneous. <laughs> uh, I got the call, got the message. Hey, I'm thinking about coming to New Orleans. I said, do it. The yes. brain, Seth's brain gets going. <laughs> um, yes. It's... Well, this is the fourth interview I've done in four days. So I'm, I'm just oh, on, my a, goodness. I'm on a roll. Wow. Um, I'm excited about this podcast. I'm excited about sharing different he healing modalities that people might not know about, might have a preconceived notion about, or just want to learn more about. And what I like about this is, very selfishly, this is all a great learning experience for me. Yes, right. My mind is being blown wide open. I learned a lot about sound healing today, so appreciate your um, experience and your time. Sure, and I, I bless you on your journey of this, um, you know, focusing on healing right now and how it relates with your whole life, you know, holistically. It's amazing. Yep, and we we need it. You know what I'm saying? Um, it really was spawned from the obsession with this new virus that's going around. I now, what's that? I don't know. I won't name it, but you know, people say the past 18 months. Yeah, there's been really heavy stuff happening the past 18 months, all in the name of health. 
And I don't see enough focus on true holistic health. Mm. All I see is the focus on a particular medical intervention. Mm -hmm. And it's like, wait, if this is about health, let's talk about diet. Let's talk about fasting. Let's talk about sound. Let's talk about emotions. Let's talk about relationships. Let's talk about it all. Mm -hmm. So this has been a great sound healing journey. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to definitely put some of this stuff into practice. Good. And if you're listening, you can too. You know, open up that uh, drone please online or just create one with a piano or a guitar loop pedal yeah know, and whatever. if you have questions oh that right i'm the loop pedal i i use that too in a lot of the sound healing stuff that's fantastic yeah, oh yeah it's really good that unlocks a lot of cool stuff it does yeah and i was just gonna say if you have any questions or anything you know just get get a hold of me on the website megruby.com are you doing any workshops or live events coming up I, I just did an eight-hour workshop uh, over a weekend for uh, international yoga teacher training. Okay. So, um, and then I'm doing that again in a few months. Um, so, yeah, right now I'm kind of taking some time for myself to uh, travel and check out the, the good old United States and <laughs> see what's happening. There's a lot to explore. There is. Yeah. Hey, big thanks to Chris Butcher, the audio engineer. Chris, thank you so much. For this episode and um, and his space and his piano and his, uh, his it's time. It's a wonderful space. Yeah. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That was Radical Health Sound Healing with Meg Ruby.